Thanks to all of you for being here today. I'm really happy to be a part of this series. It's obviously an important and timely topic and one that I think is um, foremost in everybody's minds, not just at Facebook. I want to share our approach to content that supports terrorism, both from what we, what we have in place in terms of policies and then also some of the challenges that we face in trying to make sure that this content isn't appearing on our side and to make sure that we are doing everything we can to be responsible and provide that information to the appropriate authorities when we do come across it. Just to give you a sense of how this issue affects Facebook, first looking at the size of our community, the whole reason Facebook exists the reason that Mark Zuckerberg created it and the reason that we, we all work there is because we want to create a place where people can come together and connect and share the things that are important to them, talk to friends, make new ones, all the, all the sort of general stuff that, uh, that you would expect, as well as sharing, aware, raising awareness and, and sharing news value. Um, that's something that over time, as the site has grown, we've really seen take off, and we've seen it take off in many different corners of the world. In fact, uh, now more than 80% of the people who use Facebook are outside the United States. So there's a lot of great sharing going on. At the same time, we want to make sure that the site is safe. And to us, that means not allowing people to exploit our services to promote violence or terror groups. It's challenging because of the size of our community. And to give you a sense of that, right now on Facebook, we have 1.6 billion people regularly using the service. And like I said, the vast majority of those are outside the US. We have billions of posts shared every day. We have a set of terms that I don't know, if it, has anybody in here seen our, our community standards? Have people looked at our community standards? Okay, some people have. Um, we have a set of terms that is public facing called our community standards. It basically says here are the things that are not allowed and it covers not just dangerous organizations like terror organizations but also uh, bullying and harassment, um, uh, child exploitation, a lot of different subject matter that you, you might expect to be in there. We have a team called our content policy team that I manage and that's responsible for overseeing those policies and the way that they're implemented. Largely speaking, that means that people, when they're using the site, if they see something that violates one of those standards, they can report it to us directly through the tool. If you're using Facebook, I don't know, has anybody in here ever reported content on Facebook? Yay, okay, good. Um, good, because we, we think of this as being uh, really a community effort. We want to make it very easy for people to stay in control of their experience on Facebook, and that means not only being able to unfriend somebody or block somebody, but also being able to report content that really shouldn't be there. So every piece of content on the site, whether it's somebody's profile or a page or a group, or a photo, or a caption on that photo, or a content on that photo, any of that can be reported. And when it's reported, it goes to a member of our community operations team, and a, a person reviews it and makes a decision about whether or not it violates our policies. So who's writing these policies? My team is a global team. They're in five offices around the world, soon to be six, but it's very, it's very global. And the backgrounds of the people on the team are um, fairly diverse. Most of them are lawyers, but different types of lawyers. We have people with a human rights background in, in several different regions around the world. Um, of course, I would, like Matt mentioned, I was a federal prosecutor before I came to Facebook. We have people with experience at NGOs, um, a woman from, who worked at a rape crisis center, somebody from uh, uh, Online Safety Institute, Family Online Safety Institute. Um, so a number of people that, that come from different backgrounds to, to come together and try to write these policies. Um, but we can't do this 
without talking to people in the external community. So in fact, and I've, this isn't the first time that I've, I've been to uh, this wonderful institute because we do maintain dialogues with a number of institutions and NGOs who can help us better understand these issues. In the area of terrorism, it's something that we do very frequently. Um, in fact, a, um, somebody who works here at the Institute is a regular, uh, a regular uh, phone call or email for me when I have questions about how we should be interpreting things that are happening out in the world. Um, and we do that with a, a number of other folks as well to try and stay in, on top of them. Um, so what are our rules when we get down to the details with what we do with, ter with content that supports terrorism? We look at this from a perspective of dangerous organizations. We don't allow any member of a terror group or violent organization to have a presence on Facebook. That's a pretty broad policy. That means that we don't allow them, even if, if this was somebody who is purporting to be a member of a terror group, we don't check to say, uh, yes, but do we think this person's lying? If somebody sets up an account and they purport to be a terrorist or a member of, let's say, Boko Haram, it doesn't matter what they're talking about in their account. They're simply not allowed to be on Facebook. The second policy is if people are promoting or supporting these groups or their actions, we will remove that content. It doesn't necessarily mean we'll close the account of that person. If somebody shares, for instance, um, they share a video and a, a photo of the ISIS flag and they say, I think these guys are great. That content, if we're aware of it, we will remove. The consequence for the person who posted it, it really depends. If, the person, if that's the person's uh, first time violating our policies, generally speaking, they will get a warning. But keep in mind that uh, there are, we have many different policies. If somebody had, for instance, um, you know, posted bullying content in the past, then there might be a more severe consequence. So the con if supportive terrorism is dealt with looking at the person's history on Facebook and the consequence, the content is removed, but the consequence for that person's account is determined according to the overall picture. Actually, before I go to that slide, let me back up. Now, one of the tricks for us is in enforcing these policies when we get them, because believe it or not, we get more than a million reports a day from the community. And those aren't specific to supportive terrorism. That means we get a million, more than a million reports a day of content that may violate any of our policies. When you report something on Facebook, like I said, it does come into a team of, of real people that are reviewing it. Those teams are based around the world. They're reviewing content in more than 40 languages. If they don't, if we don't have somebody who is a fluent speaker of the language uh, that the content is being reported in, then uh, we sometimes have to reach out to external translation services. I mean, this is, this is not an easy enterprise when you think about the scope with which we're dealing. The other trick for us is making sure that we're getting the reports to the people with the right subject matter expertise. Every reviewer is trained in every policy. So if you start a job at Facebook, you join our community operations team, you will be trained in our policies from bullying, self-harm, harassment, child exploitation, um, hate speech, terrorism, all of it. And you'll be responsible for knowing all of those policies. But of course, as you might expect, people develop expertise over time in certain areas. And so when something is an edge case, it's a little close to the line, a difficult call needs to be made, we send that content to our people who are subject matter experts in the specific area. That means that we have subject matter experts in reviewing supportive terrorism. For that, for, uh, that team, the community operations team, we provide ongoing training, which means having, uh, having academics, researchers, people out in the field who are uh, really seeing these issues firsthand come in and talk to our teams about terms that are being used, iconology, understanding some of the trends. And those who are subject matter experts in terrorism, we're regularly sharing guidance within Facebook on things that we're seeing on the site. Um, it doesn't mean, despite all these efforts, that we won't have mistakes. In fact, we do have mistakes. 
one of the one of the mistakes that I was just uh, talking to Aaron Zellen about was at one point I got a I think an email from Aaron telling me that we had Facebook had taken down in a counter ISIS page and we looked into it and what we saw was that this was uh, a page that was speaking out against ISIS but our when it had been reported our reviewers looked at it and thought boy there's a whole lot of ISIS stuff on there and and they judged too quickly and they ended up removing it so these calls are nuanced there's a lot of context necessary at more than a million reports a day you're going to make some mistakes and we do but the process is very much an, an iterative and a reflective one where we do quality audits every week we then go back and talk to the reviewers where we're seeing particular issues we'll issue more guidance for them if it's unclear how they're supposed to interpret a certain word or uh, something like that then uh, we'll make sure that they're getting that guidance so that we can do better going forward we also are mindful of the fact that even if we were perfect at finding and removing any content on the site that supports terrorism, it still is not the way that we fix this problem. It's, it's important for us to be responsible, and we're, we're doing that. But at the same time, we know that if we want people to actually stand up and challenge this ideology, that is actually accomplished through more speech. Speech that encourages people to actually take a hard look at these groups and what they stand for and to question it. With that in mind, we've been investing in what I'll call counter speech. And I've, I've used that term in a number of audiences and people will rightfully point out that that term assumes or gives primacy to the opposing viewpoint. So if you're talking about speech that counters terrorism, are you saying that the terrorist content is the primary content? That's not why I use that term, I'm just using it for simplicity's sake. Um, but what we mean by counter speech is positive speech that is raising awareness or pushing back or encouraging people to question hateful or extremist ideologies. We've seen this sort of content for years on Facebook. I mean, some examples that, that may resonate with people f across a variety of areas. We've seen, for instance, with uh, students who are being bullied. We've seen other students come together and change their profile pictures in support of the students who have been bullied. We've seen um, marriage equality movement. We've seen raising awareness about Boko Haram with the hashtag Bring Back Our Girls. That campaign, by the way, attracted in a span of, I think, just over a, a week, maybe two weeks, uh, more than 200,000 followers on Facebook. And probably was the first time for a lot of Americans that they'd really heard of, um, of Boko Haram. We, we saw the hashtag I'll ride with you campaign in the wake of the Sydney siege. And this was a counter Islamophobia campaign that again attracted hundreds of thousands of followers in just a few weeks. We also saw in the wake of the uh, Charlie Hebdo attacks, people organized events on Facebook saying stand in solidarity with the victims, take a stand against terrorism. And we saw more than 7.2 million people respond to those events saying that they were going to attend and stand in solidarity of the victims. So we knew anecdotally that this sort of speech was happening on Facebook and we knew that it was happening in the area specifically of terrorist groups and, and violent ideologies. But what we wanted to do was look at it more from a data approach and see if there was anything we could do to empower people to create that speech. Sometimes I get the question, does that mean that we are actually creating speech? And I want to be really clear, we're not creating speech. We, Facebook is not the speaker. We are the place. We're the space for people to come and talk. But what we want to do is make sure that people know how to use that space and how they can best engage. So just as we have done trainings for small business owners on how best to uh, reach their audience, so are we doing trainings for people who want to speak up against hateful and violent ideologies. We've been working with a, a lot of partners around the world. I just picked a few to put on this slide, but uh, they're by no means the only ones. We're doing research with Demos, a think tank based in the UK, to look at the types of speech against violent extremism that are succeeding on Facebook 
and then teasing out what is it about some of these campaigns, about some of these posts that make them do well. If we can identify those factors, then we can impart them to others who want to share the same message in their region. We started off with demos in an initial phase about two years ago. And if you can think back two years ago, the, the landscape looked a lot different. And so what we asked demos to focus on was finding counter hate, hateful and counter hateful messages on Facebook so that we could see how are these things being shared and what, te what tends to make them successful. We hadn't really thought about it this way, maybe some people in this room have, but what we realized was that uh, the people who are spreading hateful ideology often are, it's a small minority, but they're not doing anything else. These people don't have jobs, the, or they don't have a job outside of this realm, so what they're mostly doing is spending their time online issuing a lot of speech. What we found when it came to speech against hate was that it's a very broad group of people, but these people do have jobs, these people do have other interests. I mean, most people in this room, uh, obviously, from your attendance here today, people in this room care about this issue. I doubt many of you are, are online uh, posting against hate and extremism every day. Um, I'm not, and it's, it's something that I care very deeply about. So what we were trying to understand was how do we understand how, how this speech is flourishing against extremism. The factors that we've identified that really matter, number one is the form of the speech. These are not in order of priority, but one is the form of the speech, meaning photo versus video versus long textual post um, versus link. And what we've seen is that the visual imagery is very important. Keeping it short is important. If it's a video, it has to be short. It, the average length of viewing for videos on social media is shockingly short. So if you have a video that is five minutes long, it's not gonna be the way to reach an audience. The tone of speech is also something that's very important. We saw, for instance, when we looked at our first wave of research from demos, which is now, it's been published, and, and um, we can provide that link. Uh, the content in France was often on the, the hateful pages themselves. Now, I have to be careful when I say hateful pages because we actually will remove a page uh, when it has a certain th uh, threshold, after we've removed certain hate speech at a certain point, we'll just remove it. So we were dealing with a pretty limited window here. But on pages that we identified that were um, more hateful ideologies were being espoused on those pages, about a quarter of the content on those pages was actually standing up against, speaking back, um, against that hateful ideology. But it was, a lot of it was not constructive. It was more in the attack, attack sort of mode. You people are all idiots, this is really stupid. Only an idiot would think that. Uh, that sort of counter speech didn't tend to do very well. What, <laughs> what we saw and said was that um, the more positive, constructive messages, getting people to ask questions, um, using humor and satire, that was what worked. And then finally determining the most effective speaker. This one's a little bit more complicated. It's important to understand your audience in order to figure out who is best going to reach them. But the one thing that we noticed was um, if you are, uh, for instance, trying to reach young people who are skeptical about authority, having, having a government speaker is probably not gonna be, that's probably not gonna be the most compelling voice for them. Having a celebrity um, or somebody who's a young person or somebody who has stood in their shoes is probably more likely to work. With that in mind, as we've been training groups, we've been asking them to figure out what their goal is. Is their goal to raise awareness? Is it to turn people away from violent ideologies? Once they identify that goal, who are they trying to reach? For some campaigns that are, are narrowly tailored to a, a, speci I'm sorry, a specific audience, um, that might mean there's really only one speaker that will reach them. For instance, at the bottom of the funnel, if you're trying to reach people who are actively considering extremist ideologies, who are, as some would say, starting to go down a certain path, then those conversations have to be held in a certain way, and they are not going, most people are not going to be able to reach them. Um, if you're talking about potential recruits, you have somebody that you think is an at-risk demographic, then there may be more voices that can reach them. Indirect influencers, maybe you're trying to reach uh, young people in a certain area, 
indirect influencers could, could uh, include parents, teachers, other people in their age group who are in different areas. And then finally, you may just be trying to raise awareness overall, trying to get people to understand uh, what Boko Haram is, what their ideology is, and why it matters. Getting into some of the research, uh, and, and I should say, we did, I mentioned the first wave of research that we did with demos, which we've published. We're now in the middle of a second wave. It's almost done. This is specifically counter-violent extremism messaging. And uh, we've looked specifically at a number of pages, at, at more than 1,000 pages that are related to counter-ISIS messaging to see what exactly is working. We're looking in six countries around the world, and I'm going to share some content that we've seen from France and the UK. While this has not been formally published yet, we have shared this content with um, civil society audiences and others who are interested in, in creating content against extremism. We noticed that there were direct and indirect ways of countering this extremist ideology. For instance, these were the, the categories in the slide were the six most common categories. This is either from France or the UK. I, I think it was, I think this one was UK, but I'm not positive. Um, but what we saw was it was important to, especially among a younger demographic, to understand how to differentiate Islam from radical Islam. And I'm going to share with you a surprising example that we saw in that category. It's surprising because of its form. Um, here it is. That's not a post, at first glance, that you would think would do very well on social media. Uh, it's, it looks like a book. Um, however, the tone was constructive, and this was an educational post about how to explain how the extremist ideologies of groups like ISIS do not represent Islam. Uh, that is important for a certain demographic to be able to articulate for themselves. If they don't know what to say, uh, they're, they feel very uncomfortable by the whole topic. If they feel like they can read this and understand how to make themselves uh, heard, then, then they feel much more comfortable. So we actually saw this post was widely shared. When we judge success of this counter speech, it's hard. You, know, you don't know exactly when does something actually affect somebody and change their mind. So we're looking in the lim and measuring in a limited way that we can, which is how many people are interacting with this content and how widely is it shared? If I share it, but then it's shared six other times and it, it gets to people who never would have interacted with my page in the first place, that's a very good sign. We also saw examples, again, this is the sort of indirect getting people to a place where they're not going to be tempted by violent extremism. Uh, we saw pages that were non-religious, but asking people to think hard about their comparisons of different groups. Those were some of our most interacted pages overall. And the, I, I picked one image to put up there. The text on it says, if you don't think these people represent all Christians, then why do you think these people represent all Muslims? Again, a way of getting the conversation going in a, in a more nuanced way. In addition to what we're, we've been doing with demos, we're also supporting some other efforts by various groups to engage in different types of counter speech. And, and one that um, one group we're working with is the Institute for Strategic Dialogue. They put out some research back in, I think it was September, possibly October, about one-to-one -one interventions. And I mentioned earlier those can, be, those can be complicated conversations. They pointed out, again, the messaging tone is very important. And that a lot of this had to start in a very casual and non-accusatory way until there was sort of a relationship that was built up. But they were, they did have success. And they measured success in maybe a, a, a narrower but deeper way. We were looking at data across big groups to see how content was shared. They were looking at specific cases and seeing whether or not it appeared the person had turned away from the violent ideology. But it's, it's a really interesting study. Um, and then finally, I do want us to have a lot of time for questions. So uh, finally, I'll point out that one of, the, <coughs> one of the things we're interested in doing is gamifying the, the creation of this sort of speech, making it something where we can uh, make it fun for people and maybe a little competitive to start experimenting with creating counter speech. 
um, especially for young people. This can be a way of getting people interested and involved. So we've been partnering with some external groups who excel in this area. One of them is Adventure Partners in collaboration with the uh, State Department and Facebook, Adventure Partners has been running a program called Peer to Peer, where university students from around the world compete in a semester-long course to create a campaign that counters violent extremism. We had the award, excuse me, we had the award ceremony a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, here in Washington, where we brought in six finalists from around the world and they presented their campaigns in this sort of uh, Shark Tank kind of style where there were judges who, who questioned them about how their campaign is working and how it's likely to work in, uh, in the future. The campaigns were incredible. The team that won, we had two different award ceremonies because they were two different awards, but the uh, team that won the first day was from Pakistan and their project was about getting people, it was called From Apathy to Empathy, and it was designed to get people in a country where they are likely to, one way or another, have been uh, touched by violent extremism, it was a way of getting them to actually stand up and start talking about it. The university that won the second day, which was the Facebook award, was a university from Finland. It was a, a less direct approach, but the idea was they have a lot of refugees and other migrants resettling in Finland, and they want them to feel a part of that community and not be tempted by violent ideologies. So they created an app that helped people resettle into, into Finland. The app, this I'm showing this uh, screenshot from their uh, presence, their web, their web page online. Um, but one of the things that was amazing about it was they reached a third of the population in Finland. Um, and that means people were interacting across all different demographics in Finland. They had it in Finnish, Arabic, English, and this was a way of sort of bridging the divide. So we're seeing a lot of really uh, interesting efforts being created through those partnerships. We're also trying to make it easier for people through Facebook to launch these sorts of campaigns. And I just, we have many efforts, but I picked one, which is something that we're doing for people if they're trying to raise money or use nonprofits. We're making it, the interfaces are just easier to create this sort of speech so that they can, once you bring down the barriers, you can get more people involved. So uh, the next steps for us, we're going to continue with the research. We're still, we're learning specifically in different regions how speech against extremism is doing, and it takes a very different shape when you look at, at different countries. For instance, we're looking in Europe, we're looking in the Middle East, we're looking in Asia. Um, what you see in those regions, it's, it, it really varies in terms of what resonates with people, what, who the right speaker is, and what kind of speech will flourish. So as we're learning that, we're working with uh, partners like uh, Adventure, who's doing the, the university program. We're working with Affinis Global to do hackathons where we bring together, we just did one this past week, where we uh, bring together civil society groups to compete over 24 hours in, in coming up with campaigns against extremism, and then we, we help and fund the winners. Um, and we will be sharing those findings also with policymakers as well. And maybe at, at that point, I'll stop and answer some questions.